I did a lot of writing when I was a kid, like short stories and novels and poems. Um, over the years, uh, I have less time to do strictly written stuff, and I've, it, I feel like songwriting for me is almost a cop-out in the sense that it's quicker for me to come up with something and put it together than it would be to, say, write a novel. But I like to think I pack a novel into <laughs> You did every song in that summer, for sure. <laughs> but this line, the ghosts of poets past, they hide behind the mask. What are you saying there? Because um, you said you started getting angry with Elliot as you developed this song. Anger is a stronger word. It's uh, just having a conversation. We're just talking. I'm just pointing at you. Um, see, I don't know which lines are mine and which are Elliot, because I literally, again, because I don't have a lot of time in my life to devote to songwriting, in my head I was like, okay, if it's going to be a conversation with Elliot, let me read his essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. So literally, the first, core, or first verse is words pulled from part one of his essay, and the second is pulled from part two. So that is tradition. And it, he's talking about, um, I think a lot of his argument was don't inject too much of yourself into your work. Don't turn it into a braggy Facebook post or a woe is me thing. Have a little artistic distance. I take issue with whether you know that is always you know something that uh, you should do, but definitely considering the ghosts of poets past is is something that I do, and I think about the uh, the tradition and the influences and the bigger picture of um, art and history and music and the role in it. Uh, there's also the fine line that I find between how much are you being influenced by something and how much is it influencing you and how much is, you know, the fine line between um, being inspired by something and then just going ahead and plagiarizing or stealing. Like, what is that fine line between borrowing and stealing? Great. I'll move on to Taina. You talk about all the women you interviewed for that song, and, and your new album also has a documentary component. Do you approach these almost like a, a journalist or a documentary filmmaker before you begin writing, or do you even have an idea of the song before you do those interviews, or does it grow out of those interviews? Um, for this, for the purposes of this album, um, it definitely came out of the interviews. So I, you know, when I filmed the interviews, um, and that I watched through them, took notes, plagiarized words that yeah, they said. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, again, not, I don't even remember what words are mine and what are theirs sometimes. Um, but uh, you know, looking for my own story also in theirs, because I think in order for me to authentically share this song, I needed to s hear some piece of my own mind and spirit in it. Um, so, uh, you know, I also drew, I, you know, I, I would draw, I make drawings that the album has the songs, the video components. So I made these like video documentaries that go with the, the songs. Um, we're still making them, but we have a couple out already. Um, and then I made drawings to go with them. Um, so after I did all of that, then I would hit the page and I would start to compose the music. Sometimes I would hear the music first, sometimes I would see the lyrics first and kind of bring that together. And how about the, re the title and the recurring, Even If, Even If, does that come early on or is that the end after, when do you find your title to your songs, I guess? Oh, titles are like last minute, like I, I don't even care that much about titles to be quite honest. Um, I'm really, in my opinion, my personal opinion, I'm not like the best at thinking about a title for a song, um, but even if the chorus line um, so that song was less so a particular person's individual story. That one was a little bit more out of my own story and also pieces of some of the other stories, um, along with the Me Too movement and sort of the cultural uh, shift that was happening at the time that I was writing the song. Um, and so, you know, it actually came out of a little bit of a, an experience that I had been going through personally, um, where I had to 
you know, I have, I'm a women's studies major. I've been identified as a feminist my, you know, for a long time. And I, you know, I feel like I'm somebody, you know, who mentors other, you know, younger people in, in these topics. And yet here I was, you know, at this age and time in my life still having to remind myself of this really simple idea that sexual harassment and sexual assault is not my fault. And that, you know, just even if, you know, there's no excuse, like, it's not my fault. So, it, you know, that repetition is my mantra. It's my way of reminding myself of that, so, yeah. I mean, in parts of it, there's real anger, it feels like, and I also, how do you take a song to move from meant to entertain or whatever to, to make change? I mean, you want this song to change people's opinion to some of your songs to, to start a social movement or, or join to a, a movement of resistance. How do you make a song that's gonna get people to go out and march or to, you know, take action? I think that um, being authentic and true to the word and true to my, and, and, and honoring my truth, I think that cuts through. Um, I think people are able to feel that. Um, it's not, for me, my music personally is not about entertainment, though people can be, you know, I, I do intend for it to have an element of enjoying, um, of, of joy, of reclamation of joy. Um, and that's certainly a thread that is woven into my music, but I think more it's about lifting up um, lifting up my truth through the power of the word and the power of the song. And so, you know, that first has to come from my own, it's birth for, you know, through my own need for that. And then the intention is that it resonates with other folks, but it's sort of secondary, really. Thank you. Uh, and, and Michael, you're, you're writing all the time. For a while you were writing you know, theater reviews, music criticism, you write for your job. Do you have like a songwriting notebook when you get an idea? How do you hold an idea with all the other writing and things you're doing? Do you have a, a specific notebook where you're writing down ideas or do you actually sit and start composing when you want to write, write a song? I think there's perhaps these days more intent than inspiration. Um, I write virtually every day, but unlike creative writers, I'm not writing poetry or novels, I'm, I'm writing for money every day. I, I have, do a, a lot of freelancing still, I write every day at Proctor's. And the thing I like about that is I feel like my toolkit is ready. I feel at least when it comes to the lyric part of writing, my tools are, are sharp. Um, Brian mentioned the fact that we're all a little busier now, we're older. I don't have the things happening in my life that directly inspire songs the way they used to, heartbreak songs, breakup songs. Things aren't pretty even keel like now, and I'll take that. Um, for now. For now. Uh, so this project working on, the, on the, the songs based on literature was very interesting, and for me, the nice challenge was that uh, um, when I first met Brian, I was doing sort of the career path as a songwriter, carried my little notebook in my pocket all the time, had the ideas. I just recently threw out a page, uh, it was actually a piece of cord cardboard, the back of a notebook, probably 25 years old, that was just a list of titles. Um, once a notebook passes a certain age, I don't keep it anymore. They, they hold me back more than they inspire me. So that's gone. Um, sometimes the song comes from titles, sometimes they come from ideas. That part happens different. But as I said, now there's more intent involved. The song I did tonight uh, was interesting in that um, as I was working on it, I started to realize that I was ripping off Phil Oaks Gas Station Women uh, harmonically. And so really reshuffled the way things worked. Instead of going from a one to five, I go to the two minor. Those are things I wouldn't have done had I not been playing in the jug band for the past 14 years because I learned so much about music and its construction from the guys I play with. So now as much as anything when I sit down to write a song, I'm challenging myself musically. Um, I write using my voice, which is not the world's greatest instrument, but finding different ways to express that and literally doing something as simple, and this is songwriter talk, but as simple as saying, let's start the melody on the five. Let's start it on the five chord of the progression instead of the one chord. And things like that make you think in a different melodic way. They shape the way you're going in a different way. And then because of that, the words get shaped in a different way. If there's any sort of signifier of the way I write, there's usually a little kernel that's some words and some melody, and the song will come out of that. 
Um, I am thinking of Juanita. And that I had, and everything else sort of came from that. Um, so the long answer is no, I don't really keep a, a songwriter's notebook anymore. I will occasionally scratch down an idea. But what I do more now is I sit down conceptually. I wrote a song on Wednesday, and I play with, a, among the many groups I play with, one does sort of Irish music. And so I wanted to write one of those sort of sing-along in a bar Irish kind of songs. Um, and just really knuckled down and tried to make it very hooky, uh, tried to make it not as sad as, <laughs> as that one. Um, so that's the way I approach it now, is almost more as a, each song is a little project on its own, rather than some flash of inspiration. I'll ask each of you, but I'll start with Michael. You mentioned that good songwriting, like any writing, is about revising. How many drafts does these songs that you performed tonight had it gone through? Five, ten, a hundred? I tend to write almost always a whole song in one sitting. There are some songs, John Prine made a great remark once. He said he, he uh, wrote this song in ten minutes and ten years. I worked on it for five minutes ten years ago, and I worked on it for five minutes just now. Some songs do that. I tend to finish a song in a sitting, then relentlessly tweak it as it goes through its performance. But in that sitting, there's just lots and lots of editing that's happened. There's going through, making sure there's not redundant words, making sure if there is a redundant word, it serves a function. Um, uh, once you were my true love, that's not true anymore. Balancing the repetition of that word. Um, so there's an awful, awful lot of editing of the music and the words. For example, that, that song I started with, as I mentioned, it was completely reharmonized from the ground up. And so by the time it was done, if you were to listen to the various takes of it, you could see the progression that went through to get where it eventually en ended up. And then after that, in the months that you perform it, I think all of us would agree that as you perform a song, uh, it gets a little reshaped as well. Taina, how many drafts do your songs go through usually? I was thinking about that. Um, I would say that usually in about a day or two, I have the general framework of the lyrics worked out. Uh, sometimes I'll, the chorus will come really naturally. Sometimes it's the verses, and then I, you know, write a chorus afterwards. Um, but uh, you know, I'm I'm writing lyrically. I'm you know writing, and then um, and then I'm all, musically I'm writing for a nine-piece band. So I'm, I'm writing and arranging, you know, for a nine-piece band. So musically, there's definitely shifts, and I, I, I would say the musical process takes much much longer than the lyrical process. Um, I write in multiple languages, so 50% of this album is in Spanish and 50 is in English. Um, and sometimes, uh, you know, it just, especially in Spanish, it takes me a little bit longer to write, um, just because I think in English now, you know, so just bringing my brain, so that takes a little bit more time. And then um, as I sing the songs, I, I often find that I have to shift, you know, I, that I'm editing as I'm singing, you know, it, whether it's just the voicing of it or lyrically, you know, as I'm, as I'm, as I'm singing, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing like, oh, me, this word is coming to mind. Um, occasionally, I write the music and then I just verbalize over it and I record it and then I, you know, just kind of pull pieces from that and um, so that's a little bit of a different kind of lyric writing and editing process. How about you, Brian? Usually I wait for a friend to post video of their yeah. child Children playing, playing piano, piano, and then I just I go from there. Um, <clears throat> usually it starts with, I usually start with music first, primarily. Um, that's not a hard and fast rule, but once I have like a rhythm and a groove, then I'll start just kind of freestyling over it or go back to notebooks of, you know, little pieces of ideas that I've had. Um, and then once I get kind of a, I don't want to say a hook, like a musical hook, but just a hook more as an idea and a concept that I can build it around, and then it starts to kind of build from there. And then I kind of think of the structure which lately is verse, chorus, verse, chorus, freak out, <laughs> chorus, outro. Um, 
But um, how yeah. much do you revise the freak out? <laughs> Uh, always, always revise. I, I do do a fair amount of editing and try and whittling things down and getting them efficient and economical. And I am going to walk out and anyone who wants to ask a question, but since I know some of your co co-workers are here, um, oh how God. many songs have you written in your office, Brian? <laughs> I'd really like to know. Just the one. I, that's a great song. <laughs> So who has a question for our songwriters? Uh, just raise your hand. Brian, since uh, most of the musical terminology uh, uh, from the classical world is in Italian, would you refer to that as a freakouto? <laughs> I think my song also had that a freakout moment as well. Yeah, you did. Moment you did. As well. Yeah. 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 So we got our mind, first in question. Mind the character right here. totally freaked out before the song. Hi, uh, Hi. This has been really interesting. Um, I've been a songwriter since I was about eight. I started out on the piano and then I migrated to the guitar and that's been my main instrument. But I've always sort of been a basement player and I, I never really played with full bands. I've played with folk groups and I've done a lot of open mics and stuff. But it's time now to move it to the next step and I'm going to be going into a studio and I'm scared to death. And I, I, <laughs> well, you should be. I've been practicing these songs over and over and over to the point where I got really bad tendonitis in my left hand. And I just was wondering if you have any tips about going into the studio the first time. And, um, you know, I'm just going to be recording probably two songs so that I have something to show people and to, to move this process further. So I was just wondering if you had any tips or experiences that you can relay. Know the two songs you're going to record. Know them upside down and backwards. Um, the more you're prepared, the less nervous you'll be. It's your first time in the studio, you're going to be very nervous, but you'll be less nervous the better you know the material. When I go into studio, I, um, I really try to make the space feel uh, home and connected. I, I actually create a little altar, and I'm not recommending you do this, but whatever way that is your version of this, um, but my version looks like I, I create an, an altar, a, a space, uh, you know, a sacred space in that space. And, um, you know, I, I bring in some different objects that kind of remind me of my intentions of, of being there. Um, and, uh, you know, just make it like a warm environment. And when I bring in my musicians, you know, we do a similar thing in, in ways that make sense for them. Um, so any way that you can get more comfortable in the space, you know, whatever it is you need to bring, whether, you know, it, it's your a favorite book that's inspired you or what have you, have it in the space and, and to remind yourself while you're there. Yeah. Brian, since you're also a basement songwriter like this gentleman, any... any uh... Stay in the basement. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I, I'm like afraid of people. I, I don't... Yeah. The idea of... But the first time I did go into a studio to record for real, um, I wound up taking my little four-track recorder and recording the entire album by myself just so when I got to someone who knew what he was actually doing and had the tools I would know exactly you know n not a lot of real surprises just because there wasn't a lot of time or money you know to just be in the studio and just kind of inventing stuff on the fly so I did want to know pretty have a roadmap for what I wanted to do and then once I got in there you know I, I was able to play around a bit but I did lock in to uh, knowing exactly what I was going to do. That doesn't mean you have to do like multi-tracking or anything, even just recording on your phone and just getting used to the idea of how you sound when you play it back. Mm -hmm. That helps. I mean, I, I do that now. Like even, you know, rehearsal and listening back, as painful as it is, you know, you kind of get used to it and you hear different things and you want to change stuff. So, yeah, even recording it on my phone, I find is a great Definitely. way to, uh, you know, get ready whether it's for a live performance or for recording or anything. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, this is for uh, Mr. Eck. I noticed that you were using an eight-string guitar 
Uh, is that your guitar of choice? Is that the instrument of choice that you usually use? Um, I've been playing mandolin as my main instrument. I play a lot of different instruments. I know three chords on a bunch of instruments is a better way to put it. Um, I've been playing mandolin a lot for the past probably 14, 15 years. Uh, this uh, brand-wise is called a Weber Octar. Um, the octave mandolin family goes by many names, so you could call this an octave mandolin, uh, which is a mandolin that's literally an octave lower. Uh, but in the case of this, the way it's strung, it's strung sort of similarly to a 12-string guitar, so in terminology, this is actually called a bazooki. Um, and it's uh, tuned differently than a guitar, it's tuned in fifths. Uh, and then you have the octave strings, give it that jangly aspect. Um, I still play plenty of guitar, but for backing myself, I'm finding myself more and more attracted. Uh, basically since this fall is when I received this instrument, and I've been finding myself more and more attracted to this as a way to perform solo. Okay, I also have a question for Tana. Um, I don't think that the people of this country are w aware enough of the plight of the people of Puerto Rico. As far as I'm concerned, they are part of us, even if the president thinks otherwise. And uh, it seems to me that the news about that disaster was dominated by Trump's antics when he was down there and this idiotic um, interchange between the governor and the mayor of San Juan and him. And I don't think enough people are aware that the, these people are still have a terrible plight. And I was just wondering, what you would suggest as to what people can do to help their situation. Thank you for that uh, question. Um, so, you know, part of exactly what I, what I did with this project, um, so I created a 35 minute documentary um, to show, uh, to not only lift up those stories, but to show what was happening in Puerto Rico at that time. Um, you know, they are saying that it's possible that up to 8,000 people have died um, since Hurricanes Irma Maria hit. And as, as some might not actually be aware of this, but you know, it's considered a natural disaster, but we consider it really an unnatural disaster, um, an unnatural disaster uh, that came out of um, economic devastation because of the colonial relationship with the United States, as well as climate change, which is another big factor that affected um, folks, and then uh, the continued ab abuse and neglect um, by the U.S. government uh, post hurricanes. Um, so, you know, within all of that um, has been a lot of things happening in Puerto Rico, and you know, I hope to go back and get the funding to go back and to document this more. Um, but you know, there are amazing grassroots organizations that have been responding in Puerto Rico, lifting one another up, and you'll see some of that in the documentary um, where they talk about some of that work that happened in Puerto Rico shortly afterwards and is continuing this to this day. But things like um, solar villages that have been created, rebuilding roofs with solar power in Adjuntas, Puerto Rico, to communal kitchens that have been created with um, holistic health clinics, acupuncture clinics, to to help support people's health and well-being and, and feeding folks, um, to uh, healthcare work with women and girls, to um, a new and, and beautiful agricultural movement that's been happening in Puerto Rico. So there's all these amazing grassroots organizations and people doing work. There's a, organiz there's a website called mariafund.org. And um, I, after the hurricanes, started a a um, compilation album called Viva Puerto Rico where we helped to raise thousands of dollars to donate to mariafund.org. That organization sends the money directly to those grassroots organizations on the ground in Puerto Rico doing that work. Um, and uh, I recommend supporting them because then you know that, the, that when you're sending money and lifting up those voices, those are the people that are really making the impact. Thank you for your question. songwriting, or if it does. Hmm. The way it would influence me is that um, I'm a huge fan of the songwriters we have in this area, and listening to them uh, definitely uh, inspires me. 
I was, uh, I was talking about this with someone the other day. There is, uh, like a, as you're saying, there's so many songwriters that we hang out, not as much as we used to maybe, but um, that we're all friendly with and uh, kind of talk shop with yeah. over the years. And we're all writing very different styles, very, very different, different kinds of songs. So there are no real, uh, no real rules about how to do it, but it is, it's almost like this built-in support network of, you know, friends who just kind of... Mother Judge, who we, we talked about it, earlier, yeah. um, through her work with the best damn open mic ever, she was very nurturing in that. And then what happened is a lot of us would be there uh, on the individual nights and we'd talk shop, as Brian just said. And, and that great eclecticism of we got, Michael Gerling, Roseanne Ranieri, Brian, Taina, there's just so many different voices happening all the time that you can't help sort of have your world be rocked. I would say that, um, well, first of all, I would say probably almost half of the women that I interviewed for this project are from upstate New York. Um, so their stories, and, the, and inevitably, their story, my story, is woven into this, the, this community and this, this part of the world. Um, but I'd also say that in the videos, the music videos, I direct, I write and direct, produce music videos that go with my work in these documentaries. Um, a lot of them take place here in the capital region and you know, are lifting up the, so all of the actors and the land that I'm filming is right here in the capital region. Um, and that's important to me. It was important to me to lift up my community and, and demonstrate this beauty and this power that exists right here. Uh, so yeah, it's woven into all of it. And there's a more direct connection for me as a musician than there is as a songwriter. I played in bands for about eight years before I really started writing songs. And when I was a kid, I would ride my little Mustang bicycle down a couple doors and, and sit outside the basement where a band from the early 80s called the ADs uh, was rehearsing. And uh, in between songs, I'd scurry away because I didn't want to get caught. And then a couple months later, I heard them on the radio. And the connection of these guys in the basement are now on the radio was a direct lightning bolt for inspiring me to become a musician. So not so much a songwriter, but the people in this region inspired me as a musician. We have time for one more question because I did promise there will be a sing-along and um, <laughs> we're gonna sing to the words of our great Nobel laureate, Bob Dylan, so our hang, father. hang tight. Um, last question, Kira. Thank you very much. It was beautiful, all, all three um, performances. Uh, so I'm a, a music professor at U Albany and uh, new to the area, and I'm wondering where does one find these songwriting venues <laughs> where I can meet other people who are making music and collaborate, I'm, or just is there a website? Is there? I'm partisan because I'm a board member, but Cafe Lean is a great place to start. Yes. They have a, is it Monday night now? They're open Yeah, open mic, mic. Cafe Lena. That was, uh, yeah, in addition to uh, the many open mics that Caroline's hosted over the years, I, I did meet a lot of people at uh, Cafe Lena as well, yeah. Obviously, I can't disclose the basement location, but go to buggyjive.com. <laughs> You'll find a lot of great music there. And, uh, I would, uh, can I add to that answer? Yes. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm a national artist, a touring artist, so I, I, sadly, I feel like I'm a little bit out of touch sometimes with what's happening locally because I'm traveling around and not as in touch with what's going on here. But um, I do know that there are a lot of events that are happening at Troy Kitchen, uh, particularly by and for people of color. And so that's another really important place. I know Amani Orupala, who is somebody who is, uh, uh, was in my music video, Freedom, uh, hosts, a num hosts an event uh, there, and a number of other folks do as well. So I, I can't say specifically which open mic or whatever, but that would, if I was looking, I would be looking there. Yeah.